Chapter 6 Fasting, Vigil, Prayer Man fell into an unnatural life through his fall, but now, because Christ has become man, it is possible to return to the natural life, even to the supernatural, from image to likeness, which is deification. Thus we are called to have our disfigured existence transformed, and this can be achieved by God's energy and our synergy. But this transformation is not very easy. It requires labor, sacrifice, struggle, and literally blood. In the ascetic texts of the phrase, it's well known, give blood, receive spirit. It is difficult work because the garments of skin of decay and deadening which resulted from the darkening of our noose as we grew have less, left us with a peculiar way of life which is unnatural yet seems natural to us in our fallen state. Therefore, a great struggle is required in order for man to be transformed. The transformation of man is not limited to the transformation and alteration of the soul alone, since, as we know, man is soul and body together. The body must also take part in the journey to deification, because it too will be glorified. Therefore, the struggle must involve both body and soul. Moreover, Christ's saying is well known that, quote, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, Matthew sixteen forty one. Many times we feel that our soul wants communion with God, but it encounters difficulties in the reactions of the body. The soul can repent fairly easily, but the body needs a space of time in order to follow. If we limit our struggle to our soul alone and do not extend it to the body as well, we can stumble into a rupture with traumatic consequences. This phenomenon is very well known to the ascetics who exercise in this holy practice. St. Gregory Palamas repeatedly points out that we need the spiritual armor of watchfulness and prayer for the noose and of continence for the body. Therefore, many troparia devoted to great ascetics emphasize the three great virtues, which at the same time are also spiritual weapons, fasting, vigil, and prayer. I will quote one troparian, quote, citizen of the desert, an angel in body, and proven wonder worker, our God-bearing father, Kurikakos, by fasting, vigil, and prayer received heavenly gifts. You cure the sick and the souls of those who have recourse to you. Glory to him who gave you strength. Glory to him who has crowned you. Glory to him who works cures for all through you, end quote. In this dismissal hymn, we see that in order to receive spiritual gifts, a person must himself work with God and show by his life his desire to receive them. All the spiritual gifts are fruits of the synergy of God and man, in the sense that God is the one who works and man the one who works with him. The indolent cannot receive spiritual gifts. The words of the prophetess Hannah, the mother of Samuel, are characteristic. Quote, the Lord who gave prayer to him who prays. 1 Samuel 2.9 Through these heavenly gifts, the saints become wonder workers and cure the illnesses of body and soul in those who have recourse to them with faith. These spiritual gifts are received with fasting, vigil, prayer. All the saints of the church stress the value of these virtues. We find this in the writings of the homilies of St. Gregory Palamas. Organically and essentially a part of the Orthodox tradition, he is a bearer and exponent of this tradition. In phrase of the prophetess Anna, who was a widow and did not leave the temple day and night worshiping God, and was therefore granted to be in the temple at the 40th day of Christ, he writes that she was living her life blamelessly day and night in fastings and vigils, prayers, and psalmody. Palamas Homily 5. St. Gregory Palamas speaks of the value of fasting, vigil, and prayer because on the one hand, it is the orthodox way, and on the other hand, it is also the Hagiorite way. Still today, the Hagiorite monks are very fond of fasting, vigil, and prayer, and that is why the holy mountain is completely ablaze. There are monks who fast excessively, keep vigil all night, and pray to God for the whole world. Certainly, all monks without exception 
pray for part of the night. It may be that not all the monks keep vigil every night and the whole night. It is chiefly the hesychists who do this, but nevertheless they pray at night before the sun has risen. Especially the all-night vigils on the holy mountain at the feasts of the Lord and the Mother of God, at the commemoration of saints and the feasts of the monasteries, skeets, small cells, and so forth are indicative. I remember such services with nostalgia. They express the pure beat of the holy mountain and mystically convey the experiences of the ascetic fathers keeping vigil. The feelings which they create cannot easily be described. Therefore, it is not possible to speak of the holy mountain, the ascetic life, the teaching of St. Gregory Palamas, unless one also looks into this side of the subject. I would regard it as an omission if this trilogy of the spiritual gifts, fasting, vigil, and prayer, were not to be presented. Moreover, they are closely linked together. Fasting is linked with godly mourning, which leads a person to seek the stillness of night for its expression. And this nocturnal seeking is inseparably linked with prayer. I believe that the interpretation which follows will show St. Gregory Palamas to be a really great theologian since he was a great venerable, a monk of violence, but it will show the life of the holy mountain as well. Chapter 6 continued, 1. Fasting. St. Basil the Great, speaking about fasting and, of course, about the value of it, says that fasting is older than the law, older than the Torah, because it existed in paradise and even before God gave the law. God's commandments not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the commandment of fasting. Adam's disobedience to this commandment resulted in man's death. This shows the great value of fasting. Therefore, there is no saint who did not love fasting. And it is very striking that all who repent and desire to change their way of life are very fond of the fast and they want to keep it. This explains the fact that fasting is an essential element in the spiritual life. This point will be emphasized particularly because it will show the difference between real fasting and one aspect of fasting that is much emphasized in our days, the aspect of health. And indeed, fasting, as the church has instructed us, has a bearing on our health as well, but we should not rest only on this point. We must see its close link with the spiritual life. All the Holy Fathers refer to this great theme. However, in what follows, we shall look at fasting within the teaching of St. Gregory Palamas, Archbishop of Thessaloniki. A. Fasting and Prayer First, we must say that fasting is closely connected with the spiritual life. And since the spiritual life is expressed with prayer, that is why fasting is very closely connected with prayer and can in no way be cut off from it. St. Gregory interpreting the case of the young man possessed of a demon and Christ's words, quote, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Mark 9.29 says that this most dreadful demon is the demon of intemperance and cannot come out of a man except by prayer and fasting. Through fasting, a man will bridle his body and master its insurrections. And through prayer, he will mitigate the predispositions of the soul, that is to say the passions and thoughts which excite the passions further. And in this way, he can cure the passion, quote, repelling the satanic attack and influence through prayer and fasting. Homily number 12. Because the soul is linked with the body, there are both so-called psychical and somatic passions, those of the, the, the psyche and the soul and those of the body, and fasting should therefore be connected with prayer. Fasting is the underpinning of prayer, but prayer also gives real meaning to fasting. B. The scope of fasting. But fasting is not simply abstention from certain foods, nor the selection of certain foods. Of course, this too is called fasting because by obeying the church and the way in which the church appoints fasting, we can do nothing else but submit our personal will to the Catholic will of the church. In other words, we obey Christ and the Holy Fathers of the church who have decreed it. Beyond this, fasting is a broader virtue. 
In the first place, fasting is also purity of the senses as far as possible. The saint writes, quote, If you fast from foods, but you have your eye on adultery and curiosity and jealousy in the inner chamber of your soul, and your hearing is susceptible to insults, unchaste songs, and evil whisperings, and the other senses are receptive to things which harm in a similar way, what is the use of fasting? Absolutely none. From homily number nine, end of quote. That is to say, there is no use in bodily fasting if you do not at the same time fast with the other senses, such as sight and hearing, which are the doors through which sin enters the soul and arouses passion. Therefore, at the season of fasting, many Christians take care to control all their senses. Here we see from the teaching of St. Gregory that theology is not independent of purity of the senses, because a theology which is not interested in that is not orthodox. True fasting is abstention from evils, and therefore we can speak of fasting from evil. St. Gregory, referring to a passage in the Old Testament, and especially to the words of the prophet Isaiah, quote, Woe to those who are drunk, but not with wine, says that there is a surfeit and fiendish drunkenness, which is not drunkenness with food and drink, but drunkenness with anger, hatred, and rancor. This is the most terrible drunkenness. Indeed, he writes that in those who fast and pray, the devil suggests thoughts to remember the faults of others, sets in motion thoughts about rancor, and sharpens the tongue for gossip. And the saint suggests that at the time of fasting, we should cultivate love for our neighbor. Another great sin, particularly at the time of fasting, is conceit and pride. Of course, a great temptation during fasting is self-esteem, when the person fasting tries to show it to people so that he will be considered a fine Christian. A characteristic type of this tendency is the Pharisee, who makes a display of his fasting and in general of all his keeping of the law. But self-esteem makes useless our labor of fasting and prayer. The point is that self-esteem spoils both the reward and the labor itself of fasting and prayer. But fasting should be joined with all the virtues. And naturally, when we speak of virtues, we do not mean a few acts of an autonomous moral deonatology, but the works of God, since peace, love, and justice are works of God. And when a person keeps the will of God, he participates in his works and therefore has peace, justice, love, and so forth. Thus, fasting should be joined with the virtues. The greatest of the virtues are self-control, mourning, compunction, repentance, brokenness of heart. Fasting should be joined with these in order to be acceptable to God and to give fruits to the person fasting. The saint writes, for there must be self-control with fasting. Why? Because even satiety with cheap foods prevents the cathartic mourning and the godly sorrow in the soul and the compunction which shapes firm repentance for salvation. For without a broken heart, it is not possible to enter truly into repentance. But decreasing nourishment and sleep and sensations in accordance with the will of God breaks the heart and brings it to mourn over its sins. End of quote. Homily 6. Repentance, mourning, and all the other motions of the soul cannot be brought back to their original beauty, where there is sati satiation with material food. Fasting helps towards this aim. But mere fasting without this necessary atmosphere for it, which is penitence in its full orthodox sense, does not help in the spiritual life. So one also needs bodily labor as well as compunction of heart. Otherwise, fasting becomes a formal procedure and an outward formal practice without any essential meaning. At many points in his homily, St. Gregory refers to the spiritual atmosphere in which fasting takes place. I would like to cite one further characteristic passage. The saint writes that we should fast and pray with a broken heart, with self-reproach and humility. Quote, in order that our fasting and our watching and waiting in the temple may be pure and pleasing to God. Homily 7. The fasting that is pure and pleasing to God should be done with self-reproach, a broken heart, and humility. 
A fast which is not connected with this whole spiritual ascetic atmosphere is not pleasing to God. The saint writes impressively that a fast which is not connected with the whole ascetic life has rather an affinity with the evil angels, because even the demons fast, but their own undernourishment is connected with anger, hatred, pride, and opposition to God. So then we are in danger of fasting in the way of the demons when we do not link our fasting with the whole ascetic life. But beyond this, a fast also means purity of the noose from fantasies and impassioned thoughts, interpreting Christ saying, quote, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Matthew six seventeen. He says that here the Lord is legislating that we should not try to show that we are fasting and solicit glory and praise from men. Besides this interpretation, St. Gregory also makes an anagogic interpretation of the passage. In this we can see his hesychistic life, but at the same time also an extension of the fast, which we should note particularly, because in this way we can escape the great temptation which lies in wait, the external standardization of fasting and of all the gospel virtues. The head of a man's soul is his noose, which is the ruling part, that is to say, the center of his existence. The imaginative part of the soul, which is the permanent seat of the sensory energies, is the person. When we want to make a real fast, we must anoint our noose with oil, that is to say, we must make the noose charitable. And naturally, our noose becomes charitable when it receives the grace of God. In this state, the noose is illuminated and practices noetic prayer. At the same time, we must wash away from our imagination the shameful and unclean thoughts and all anger and cunning. Such a fast not only cures a person from the passions and banishes the devil, but it numbers with the angels those who do fast. Homily 7. These things show the scope of fasting. In other words, fasting is not only the avoidance of some foods, even though this is necessary, but at the same time it is purification of the whole inner world, especially of the imaginative part of the soul, from thoughts and images and furthermore, illumination of the noose, which is the ruling part of the soul. Those people who connect fasting simply with outward practices and not with the whole ascetic life are deluded. C. The Value of Fasting In the beginning, we emphasized the value of fasting. All who are in training in this contest know from experience the therapeutic effects of fasting. It cures the souls of passions. But at the same time, it also helps the body to accompany the soul towards deification. The value of the fast is seen from what violation of it has created. St. Gregory says that if Adam had kept the fast which God gave him as a commandment in paradise... Quote, he would have remained immortal and untiring and ungrieving forever. Unquote. But Adam, he preferred the conspiracy of the devil to the advice and commandment of God. And so, instead of eternal life and the place of everlasting joy, he received death and that most miserable and disastrous place of sin, Hades, and was condemned to the darkness there. See homily, Palamas homily 6. To continue, failure to keep the commandment of the fast resulted in the fall of man with all these painful consequences which we all know. The value of fasting is also seen in the fact that it cures man. The saint writes, quote, The fast is true which spreads through all things, purifies and cures all things. Indeed, a fast which does not cure is not true. The true fast cures the person and prepares him to meet God cured which will be paradise for him. The saint says that if we heedlessly evade the fast, punishing penalties and cuttings and burnings will await us. Quote, when Christ cuts out those not cured and consigns them to the unquenchable fire for everlasting punishment. End of quote. This saying of the saint is very characteristic. He who is not cured will be taken to hell. A man should therefore be cured in this life because he goes on to say just 
as at that time in paradise we did not fast and were thrown into this very painful life. So also, if in this life we do not fast and do not show all possible self-control, quote, we shall fall into that unquenchable and unbearable Gehenna. Homily number nine. Fasting cures a man and creates the preconditions for tasting the beatitude of the righteous. To fortify this view, St. Gregory uses examples from the holy men of the Old Testament. Recalling the three children in Babylon who precisely because they were practicing self-control and fasting were protected from harm by God in the fiery furnace. And recalling the prophet Daniel who by fasting was on the one hand illuminated by God to foretell the future and on the other hand closed the mouths of the lions. He says that the same will happen with us when we fast. When we keep a fast of soul and body and at the same time pray, then with the help of the angels, the fire of anger and the desires of the flesh will be tamed as the lion was then. We will acquire prophetic grace with the hope of future good things as well as faith and noetic vision of God. We will tread on snakes and scorpions and on the whole power of the enemy. See homily 7. Actually, the soul's fast, as we explained above, as protecting the senses and the noose from images and fantasies, when it is linked also with bodily fasting, transforms our whole inner world and leads us to the vision of God, which, as we know, begins primarily with noetic prayer. The value of fasting can be seen throughout the Holy Bible. Christ, having begun by fasting, in the end set at naught the tyranny of the devil and freed us and restored us to life. Through fasting, the prophet Elijah saw the Lord coming in the sound of a gentle breeze. Through fasting, Moses received the tablets fashioned by God. Again, Moses, fasting on Mount Sinai, saw God personally and not in a figure spoke with him as to a friend, learned from God and taught the whole law through him, and indeed learned and taught that he is the ever-being and does not pass over into non-being. He created all things out of non-being, but also with his uncreated energies, he keeps man from falling into non-being. See homily 6. This whole teaching is a revelation which is given to the person who remains in a state of fasting. Certainly, St. Gregory interprets the presence of Moses and Elijah on Mount Tabor as the fruit and result of prayer, fasting. These two prophets, who more than any other men loved prayer and fasting, showed by their presence at this prayer of Christ the symphony and harmony of prayer and fasting, which means that by fasting and prayer one is deemed worthy of converse with the Lord. What is more, it is accepted by all the Holy Fathers, and of course also by St. Gregory Palamas, that it is through action and praxis connected with fasting that a person is brought to the vision of God. The great value of fasting is also seen from the opposite effects produced by gluttony. Violation of the fast leads to many troubles in man's psychosomatic organism, but even in his society as well while keeping the fast has a calming effect on man and his societies. In order to make this teaching clear, St. Gregory refers to what went on in Thessaloniki, on the one hand before Lent, and on the other hand after the beginning of Lent, when prayer and fasting had begun. He said that during the weeks before Lent, when gluttony and intemperance prevailed, there were disturbances, outcries, fights, noises, lewd songs, satanic dancings, and immodest laughter. Apparently the saint was thinking about carnival celebrations. But when the fast began, at the beginning of Lent, all this was changed to something very holy. Thus, instead of disgusting songs, the mouth was singing holy psalms. Instead of immodest laughter, there were saving sadness and tears. Instead of disorderly racings and runnings about there, was one common path for all to the Holy Church of Christ. From these things, the saint said, we see the value of fasting, but also the evil of intemperance. It was by intemperance and lack of self-control that Adam came out of paradise, 
The flood came upon mankind, the conflagration came to Sodom. By intemperance, Esau lost the status of firstborn in his father's blessing. Through intemperance, the children of Eli were punished with death. And through intemperance, the Hebrews made a calf and worshipped idols when Moses was on Mount Sinai. Thus says the saint, wantonness is not the cause of sin alone, but also of impiety. Furthermore, gluttony deadens man. Nothing is so deadening as gluttony. See homily 9. But fasting is useful to man's body as well. That is to say, it aims at bodily health. Many people avoid fasting because they think that it will take them into a decline. But quite the opposite is true. Quote, For satiation by its nature brings gout, headache, and other ills, while fasting is the mother of good health. End of quote. Homily number nine. From voraciousness, gluttony, in other words, consumption of foods, many illnesses come to the organism, while health comes even to man's body with fasting. Many scientists today agree about this, and so do dietitians who speak about the value of fasting every day. And actually, if we keep the fasts which our church prescribes, we will not have problems like these created by overeating. It is true that when we fast, our attention is not restricted just to bodily health, but we are aiming more at the spiritual side. But since bodily illness, especially when it is brought on by overeating, usually creates troubles in the spiritual organism as well, let us also examine this circumstance— and here, too, we can see the true value of fasting. D. Fasting and lack of food. Many of us have the impression that fasting is simply a matter of selecting foods. Of course, as we've emphasized before, this too has its value, for it shows that a person wants to be obedient to the church. In fact, living in the church, we do try to acquire a common ethos. We do not wish to do our own will, but the will of God, as the Holy Fathers express it. But ultimately, fasting is limited eating, and I would add it is also limited fasting. St. Gregory says that moderate fasting up to a point is permissible and necessary for everyone. It seems that in his time it was the custom for the Christians also to keep the same fasts as the monks, that is to say, to fast all day and to eat after Vespers. Thus, according to St. Gregory, a fast is both moderate food and moderate lack of food. He writes, quote, But it is enough for the food also to be moderate, for in this way, fasting moderately and eating moderately, you will not be far behind those who undernourish themselves. End of quote from homily number nine. If one cannot keep a full fast, one should have both moderate food and moderate lack of food. In this way, one avoids the extremes which are likely to produce self-esteem. The significance of moderate food and moderate lack of food is very deep. Gluttony, voraciousness, and intemperance are connected with two states which constitute a spiritual problem. One is the captivity of the noose to the senses and the material world. In other words, gluttony has the noose enslaved to pleasures and material goods. The other is that these people usually believe that foods are what keeps us alive, and thus somehow they lose the sense of God's personal intervention in our lives. Therefore, with moderate eating, but also moderate lack of food, we hunger, we suffer, and this too has great beneficial consequences, opposite to the two states of which we spoke. The first is that the noose is liberated from captivity to material goods and generally to the surrounding world, and it rises to God. And this has great value and significance for the spiritual life. The second is that we acquire a different orientation. In other words, while previously we thought that food, vitamins, and calories kept us alive, when we lack food and are hungry, we gain the certainty that God keeps us alive by his uncreated energies through the foods. Thus, material goods are not the basis of our life, but it is God himself who keeps us alive. Therefore, moderate lack of food helps one to be rightly oriented toward God. E. Demonic fasting. 
But as we mentioned in passing earlier, there is a fasting that is blessed and there's one that is demonic. Fasting which is done with self-conceit, pride, and egoism is related to the devil. St. Gregory says that a fast that is not within the spiritual atmosphere, which is mourning, compunction, and so forth, has rather its kinship with the crafty angels. See homily number seven. We know that the demons fast. That is to say, they eat absolutely nothing. They fast continually. But since they hate men and have self-conceit, which is an unclean state, it does them no good. The same happens also with those people who formerly keep the outward order of the fast, but cut it away from its spiritual content. True fasting should not be done with self-conceit. We should not aim at the eyes of men. If we are interested only in the eyes of men, says the saint, we may undergo the labor of fasting and prayer, but be deprived of the reward. It is a dreadful thing for us if we submit ourselves to such labors and nevertheless lose the reward because they were not done in accordance with the will of God. The saint, he speaks strongly on this point. He says that fasting and prayer should take place as before the face of God. That is to say, fasting should not lose its personal character. We should know that neither fasting nor psalmody nor prayer can in themselves save us, but what saves us is that these things are done before the face of God. The eyes of God which see us sanctify us. In fact, it is not outward deeds in themselves which sanctify us, but the grace of God, who watches over those who do his will. Therefore, when we practice all these actions, our noose should be turning toward God and asking his help and protection. Fasting helps to cure our souls, it is a way of life, but also a way to the kingdom and reign of God. Therefore, St. Gregory says that it is not just on certain days that we should fast, but for our whole life, because eating can be moderate all the time. He says that those who are called Christians and those who await the dread coming of Christ need to remain in self-control and fasting all, all their lives. See homily 9. This too shows the value of fasting as well as the necessity of it because the Lord heals us through our fasting. Therefore, St. Gregory urges, I beg you, let us not cease to entreat him by fasting, tears, and prayers and crying out in all ways until he approaches and cures us. With fasting, tears, and prayers, we call to Christ to come and cure us. The fast is a part of the therapeutic treatment of the church and we can only regard it as such. The way in which St. Gregory expresses himself and also the content of his teaching exhibits our way of life. The saint is a traditional theologian, a part of the tradition of the Holy Fathers. He develops the theme of fasting within the ecclesiastical perspective. He connects fasting with self-control, just as he also connects lack of self-control with lewd songs and diabolical gaieties. He does not hesitate to brand the ugly conditions and manifestations of his time. This is striking because in our time, we try to alter even the way of thinking of the fathers, also exchanging the words which the fathers use for other modern words, which, however, prettify things, but in fact distort them. We read various analyses by contemporary quote-unquote theologians and do not understand what they mean this is not so much because we cannot understand, but because they do not make clear what they mean. Perhaps they're trying to make an impression, create confusion, or conceal the true meaning of what is said. But no one finds this in the patristic teachings. Even on theological topics, the Holy Fathers are frugal, expressive, and always truthful, without calculating what the others will say. Chapter 6, Fasting, Vigil, Prayer, Continued, Part 2, Vigil. Vigil 2 is connected with fasting. Of course, the vigil is also co closely connected with prayer and cannot be understood without it. Thus also, vigil is considered essential for Christ, like asceticism, which leads a person from purification to illumination and deification, movement from the image to the likeness. Christ himself is an example of keeping vigil, as he is seen in the gospel texts. Luke the evangelist writes, quote, Now it 
came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. End of quote, Luke six twelve to 13 The choosing of the apostles took place after a night of prayer, after a vigil on the mountain, and after the miracle of the multiplying of the five loaves. When he had sent the multitude away, Christ went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, and quote from Matthew 14.23. Interpreting Christ's going up the mountain to pray, St. John Chrysostom says that Christ did this in order to teach us, quote, that the wilderness and solitude are good because one needs to meet with God, of quote. We should pursue stillness in the wilderness because the wilderness is the mother of stillness and a calm and a harbor delivering us from all turmoils. Quote from St. John Chrysostom, homily number 50 on the Gospel of St. Matthew. A. The Holy Fathers on the Vigil All the saints love keeping vigil, praying to God. I shall cite a few passages from the Holy Fathers which one can see the value of prayer at night and the fruits which one receives from it. According to St. Isaac the Syrian, fasting is inseparably linked with vigil. Quote, For the body that fasts cannot endure to sleep upon its pallet all through the night. Isaac the Syrian, homily 37. Again, St. Isaac advises choosing work filled with delight, that is to say, constant night vigil, whereby all the fathers divested themselves of the old man and were accounted worthy of the renewal of their noose. This is essential because in prayers at night, the soul experiences that immortal life, puts off the vesture of darkness and receives the Holy Spirit. The connection between fasting and vigil is also seen in another passage of St. Isaac. Those who wage this invisible warfare, quote, begin to fast and afterward night vigil works with fasting to establish their asceticism, quote, homily number 37. In all his works, St. Isaac commends and emphasizes the significance of the vigil for the monk in his struggle against the law of sin and against the devil. Among all the works of the monastic, there is no practice greater than night vigil. For even if a man's body be enfeebled by illness and he cannot fast, vigil alone can gain for the new steadfastness of soul and bestow upon his heart noetic insight to understand spiritual power. Isaac the Syrian homily 20. Thus anyone who wishes to acquire watchful noose and knowledge of the new life should never neglect the vigil throughout his life. Quote, For by vigil your eyes are opened to behold all the glory of the monastic life and the strength of the way of the righteous. Isaac says the following characteristic words, quote, A monk who perseveres in vigil with a discerning noose will not seem to be clad with flesh, for this is truly the work of the angelic estate. End of quote. And then he, he says that it is impossible for that monk to be left by God without great gifts. Indeed, as we indicated above, the vigil should be with a discerning noose, which means that the noose should not be scattered in a variety of things, but be devoted to God alone. St. Basil the Great recommends the vigil in the ascetic life of the monk and says that what, it, what is matins for the others is the midnight service for the devout ascetics. In the sayings of the Desert Fathers, we see that Abba Arsenios prayed all night and only slept a little in the early morning because of the body's nature. Quote, he used to pass the whole night without sleeping, and in the early morning when nature compelled him to go to sleep, he would say to sleep, Come here, wicked servant. Then seated, he would snatch a little sleep, and soon he'd wake up again. From the sayings of the Desert Fathers, Arsenios, to continue, the monks know from experience the value of the vigil because they use it in their warfare against the devil and in their effort for purity of heart. Therefore, St. John of the Ladder emphasizes, quote from step 20 of the Ladder of Divine Ascent, 
Vigil is a quenching of lust, deliverance from fantasies, a tearful eye, a heart made soft and gentle, thoughts restrained, food digested, passions tamed, spirits subdued, tongue controlled, idle imaginings banished. To, quote, to be sure, there are many forms of vigil according to the method, content, and time when the monk keeps vigil. This depends on the circumstances of life and on the spiritual condition of the monk keeping vigil. Some keep vigil from evening to midnight, others from midnight to morning, and others all night. Also, some spend the night reading the Psalms of David, which are very heart-searching. Others pray with prayers of repentance and compunction. Others divide the night between prayer and reading. On the Holy Mountain, which is a communion of prayer, and especially prayer at night, we find all the forms of prayer, and that is why it has a special grace and blessing. Day and night, particularly at night, it is aflame with the prayers of the athletes of devotion to God. Chapter 6 continued. B. St. Gregory Palamas and Vigil Keeping vigil is much praised by all the Holy Fathers because it has been tested in practice and proven to be a great gift of grace, which helps those who are struggling on the path to purification. It is natural that St. Gregory Palamas, too, held in very high regard anyone who lived and expressed the genuine Orthodox life and the life of the Holy Mountain. St. Gregory did not make his own monasticism, but lived the traditional monasticism. In what follows, in order to see how he lived the vigil in practice, we shall cite three instances from his life as described by St. Philotheus Kokinos. The first instance comes from the beginning of his monastic life on the Holy Mountain. As we know, when he came to the Holy Mountain, the saint was trained at the Lavra of Vatupedi under the spiritual guidance of the famous Venerable Father Nicodemus. Three years after his arrival, at the Holy Mountain, this spiritual father died, and St. Gregory moved to the Holy Monastery of the Great Lavra. His duty was to take charge of the common dining table of the monks, since at that time there were very many monks in the Lavra, and to assist in the psalmody during the services. His asceticism reached great depth. He wanted, if possible, to overcome even his natural needs. Therefore, as St. Philotheus records, he stayed awake all night for three whole months. But in order to avoid any injury to his brain, he slept just a little at noon after the common meal. The second instance is from his ascetic practice at Veoria. When he was 30 years old, he founded a hermitage of divine philosophy near Vorai. His asceticism was great. He remained enclosed five days of the week and received no one for conversation. He came out only on Saturday and Sundays to celebrate the Holy Eucharist and to have spiritual conversation with his brothers. He devoted himself to great asceticism, such that St. Philotheus was to write, quote, He was 30 years of age and still robust in body, for until that time not even the slightest illness had ever attacked him. End of quote. Actually, great bodily asceticism presupposes a robust body not attacked by illnesses. Since he had vigorous bodily health, he therefore embarked on much greater struggles in a more severe way of life, melting his body with great fasting and vigils and attempting to subject it completely to the spirit, refining and purifying his soul's power of vision by every kind of self-control and sobriety, and with habitual flowing of tears, and always leading it up to the divine re relationship by unceasing prayer and direct communion and union with God by grace. Thus, his great asceticism and unceasing tears resulted in his soul's vision, which is the noose, being purified, and so he rose to the vision theoria of God and union with God. The third instance refers to the time when he had returned to the Holy Mountain from Varai because of various raids. This time he was practicing asceticism near the Holy Monastery of the Great Lavra in the Hermitage of St. Sabas. There he remained in absolute stillness without coming out of his hut at all for company and conversation. 
he did not even see the monk who served his necessary needs. Only on Saturday and Sunday could he be seen and approached by his brothers. He rarely went to the monastery only to celebrate the sacraments when all the clergy had to be present. One holy and good, great Friday, the saint was also in the monastery, taking part in the celebration of the passions of the Lord, standing beside the abbot of the monastery, whose name was Makarios. During the night office, some of the monks standing there together began talking about unnecessary things, forgetting at that solemn moment the purpose of the gathering. St. Philotheus makes the following observation. They were talking, quote, beyond measure and exaggeratedly, if one can speak of measure in such things, end quote. St. Gregory was naturally indignant about this behavior of the group of monks. However, he did not want to tell them to stop talking, so he, he tried to center his noose away from the toparia being sung and into himself. This was the way, quote, he usually turned his mind to himself and through himself to God. Here we see that the saint was accustomed to practicing holy Hezekiah, concentrating the noose singly in his heart and letting it ascend from there to God. Just then he had a great experience. He saw the uncreated light, quote, and at once a divine light shone round him from above, and with the eyes of both his body and his soul illuminated by those rays, he saw clearly as if present what was to happen many years later. End of quote. In the uncreated light he saw the holy abbot Macarius of the monastery not wearing the usual monastic habit, but dressed in the stole of an archbishop. This came true about ten years later when Macarius became Metropolitan of Thessaloniki. We can point out several things. One is that the saint was taking part in the spiritual worship with the other monks. For reasons not dependent on his will, he made an effort to concentrate his noose. It seems that this was his custom. He experienced illumination of his noose and was able to separate his noose from reason and the surrounding world. Thus he knew the difference between the noose and reason. When later, in his struggles on behalf of holy hesychism, he was explaining these subtle aspects of the spiritual life, he knew them from personal experience. The other point is that the noose, after returning from the surrounding world, coming back into the heart, rose to God, and he saw the uncreated light with both the eyes of his soul and his bodily eyes, which, however, had previously been transformed to be able to bear this great experience. In the uncreated light, he became clairvoyant, which signifies that the gift of foresight is a state of the deified. From this circumstance, as well as from other things, it is clear that St. Gregory Palamas had, quote, spiritual assets at his disposal. He was not a theological thinker and a philosopher. He did not speak with his mind and imagination, but he spoke directly from experience. Thus he was justified in the assurance with which he expressed himself on the topics of the spiritual life and in his holy indignation at the philosopher Barlaam's misinterpretation of the patristic texts, who was absolutely ignorant of this hesychistic life. It is in this perspective that we must look at the way in which the saint expressed himself and the epithets he used about Barlaam. Furthermore, we can understand the value that vigil, sobriety, and Hezekiah have for the vision of God. In the midst of such events, St. Gregory Palamas understood the value of the vigil for the spiritual life. Through it, the soul's vision is purified and lifted up to the vision of God. Therefore, in his homilies, he advises the Christians to fast, keep vigil, and pray. I shall not keep on about the value of the vigil, because in what follows, which will be about prayer, and especially prayer of the heart, the close connection between the vigil and prayer will be seen, since the soul and body have common energies. A spiritual life without asceticism, without fasting, without a vigil, especially if the body is strong, is alien to the Holy Orthodox tradition. Chapter 6 continued, Section 3 prayer. The subject of prayer constitutes the central core of the discussions between St. Gregory Palamas and the anti-hesychist 
philosophers. It is well known that in the beginning of the so-called hesychistic conflicts, there were three topics which occupied the disputants. The first was worldly education, the second prayer, especially the psychotechnical methods for the descent of the noose into the heart, and the third, the vision of the uncreated light. Therefore, we say that prayer formed the basis of the discussions in the time of St. Gregory Palamas. Here, we're not aiming to develop the whole theology of prayer, what came before and what came after it, but we shall chiefly emphasize two particular points. One is the theological prerequisites for noetic prayer, and the other is the energies common to soul and body and their role in noetic prayer. We shall keep to these two points because they are central to the whole teaching of St. Gregory Palamas about prayer and because they are connected with this chapter, which is about how fasting and vigil relate to prayer. A. The views of Nikiforos the Solitary. The discussion began with the views of Nikiforos the Solitary, about whom we've already spoken on the subject of prayer and the psychotechnical methods used to help the noose descend into the heart. Barlam, finding himself in Thessaloniki and being a complete stranger to the whole hesychistic tradition of Orthodox monasticism, when informed about the way which St. Nikiforos was recommending, he opposed it very sharply. We shall see later just what he said, as well as what theological answers were given by St. Gregory Palamas. Here, we would like to to look a little at the views of St. Nikiforos on the, quote, scientific method of prayer. He said that a person who wished to acquire noetic prayer should seek an unerring guide. If this was difficult, he should search diligently for one. If his search for a spiritual counselor failed, he should pray to God with a contrite heart, tears, and poverty, using a special method at the same time. The heart of a man he said, is the source of life and warmth for the body. We breathe the air for the heart. The heart takes the air in so that a part of it is exhaled and maintains an even temperature. The lungs are an agent of this process. The Creator has made these capable of expanding and contracting like bellows, quote, painlessly drawing in and expelling their contents, end quote thus taking in cool air through the lung and expelling the heat. The heart performs its function for maintaining life. After describing the function of the heart and the lung, St. Nikiforos recommends the method by which concentration of the noose in the heart will take place. In order for the noose to enter the heart, he recommends that after concentrating it, it should be drawn into, quote, the nasal passage, by which the air enters the heart, and then to put pressure on the noose and compel it to descend into the heart with the inhaled breath. Then the noose will feel joy and delight in just the way in which a man who has been away comes home and meets his children and his wife. When the noose enters, it must struggle not to leave it quickly. At first, the noose feels cramped by the limitation of space in the heart, but once it has become accustomed, it cannot bear to wander outside, for there, in the heart, is the kingdom of God. However, when the noose is in the heart, it must not remain idly, but unceasingly say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. In this way, the noose is undistracted, untouched by the various temptations, and every day it increases its love and desire for God. But if, in spite of efforts, this is difficult, then something else should happen. Every person's discursive power is located in his breast. Even when our lips are silent, we speak and deliberate and formulate prayers, psalms, and other things in our breast. When we have banished every thought from there, let us say the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. We must compel our discursive power to repeat the prayer inwardly rather than any other thought. When, when this goes on for some time, it will assuredly open the entrance to your heart, as we ourselves know from experience. Then along with the prayer will come all the virtues, joy, love, peace, which will satisfy all your requests by the grace of Christ. Syndikiforos came from southern Italy and was originally a Franco-Latin. 
but he became Orthodox when he confessed the true faith, and he was one of the anti-unionists at the Council of Lyons, where the union of the churches was signed. He came to the Holy Mountain, became a pupil of the discerning Holy Fathers there, and reached great spiritual heights. This method, method which he presented was chiefly for beginners in the spiritual life. When Barlaam heard all these things, he was incensed and considered that they violated the character of prayer, which should be pure and therefore should not be limited to particular places and should not be done with these psychotechnical methods. As we shall see, it is to St. Gregory Palamas that we owe the theology of this whole method, which is for the beginners and the preservation of this hesychistic tradition about the joining of the noose and the heart. B. The Theological Conditions for Noetic Prayer St. Gregory Palamas foresaw the danger of losing the hesychistic tradition because of Barlaam's attack. It was a serious matter. At first, however, he did not have the use of Barlaam's writings, which the latter carefully concealed, and therefore he knew his views as expressed only by word of mouth. So he overthrew Barlaam's erroneous views in the second book of the first triad, which he entitled, quote, that those who have chosen to concentrate their attention on themselves in stillness are not wrong to seek to keep their noose within their body, end of quote. The problem had been put in question by a monk who was informing St. Gregory Palamas about Barlaam's views, and the saint was refuting them on the basis of spoken information. I shall present in a general way the views of St. Gregory which underline noetic prayer and which describe and form its indispensable and necessary theological presuppositions. The question is formulated as follows. Quote, they say that we are wrong to want to enclose our noose within our bodies and that on the contrary we should by all means push it outside the body. Therefore they are slandering some of us very badly and directing their writings against us under the pretext that our people are advising beginners to direct their gaze toward themselves and by inhaling to send their noose inside, saying that the noose is not separated from the soul. End of quote. Palamas Triads 1 and 2, second question, to continue. It is clear that this question referred to Barlam and his associates who were opposing the view that the noose should return to the heart in prayer and that this happens through inhalation. Clearly, the scientific method of St. Nikiforos the Solitary was being condemned by Barlam. St. Gregory's reply laid the foundations of noetic prayer, placing them within the orthodox framework and this is the reason for its great significance. The saint, living on the holy mountain, was acquainted with this whole hesychistic tradition. Therefore, it is as an expert in noetic prayer that he describes the indispensable and necessary conditions for it. First, he emphasized the truth that the body is not bad and fashioned by evil. It seems clear that Barlam had platonic views about the body. What is evil is carnal thought, and that is why the evil is not that the noose should be in the body, but that it should be in carnal thought. The body is one thing, and the bodily or carnal thoughts are another. The aim of Orthodox asceticism, as described in the Holy Bible and in the entire Orthodox ecclesiastical tradition, is to banish the law of sin from the body and establish the noose as supervisor. By the oversight and surveillance of the noose, we must legislate the needs of every part of the soul and of every member of the body. For the senses, we legislate self-control. For the passionate part of the soul, love. And for the discursive part of the soul, watchfulness, nipsis. Through this method, we feel within us the illumination of knowing God in the person of Jesus Christ. In many places in Holy Scripture, we see that it is not bad to have our noose in our body. In what follows, St. Gregory analyzes the relationship between soul and body. The soul is one, it has many powers, and it serves as an organ for the life of the body with which it was created. In the Holy Orthodox tradition, we know that the intelligence of the soul is neither outside the body, since it is attached to it, nor inside the body, as if enclosed in a vessel, 
since it is bodiless, quote, but in the heart, as in an organ, end quote. Comparing passages in such holy fathers as Macarius of Egypt and Daudokos of Photiki from the Philokalia, he says, quote, Our heart is the seat of the intelligence and the first intelligent organ of the body, end quote. See triads 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, it is necessary for those who wish to keep silence to reestablish the noose within the heart. The view that the noose must be outside the body and not outside carnal or fleshly thought is the greatest of the Hellenic errors, the root and source of all heresies, engenders folly and is itself the product of madness. End of quote. Again, the triads. This passage also suggests that Barlaam's views about prayer had a clearly platonic origin. After making this first point, namely, that a man's noose should come back to the heart from its dispersion, St. Gregory proceeds to another truth, the theological presupposition for noetic prayer. In answer to the opponent's questions about how the noose is to return within the heart, since it is always united with the soul, the saint differentiates the soul into essence and energy. Here we encounter the theological view concerning essence and energy, which will be analyzed further later on with reference to God. So, like the uncreated God and all created things, man's soul too has essence and energy. Quote, the essence of the noose is one thing, its energy another, end quote. Therefore, the noose which is scattered in the environment should return to the heart. This is supported by many fathers, among whom are St. Dionysios the Areopagite, St. Basil the Great, St. Diodotus of Photiki, and St. John of the Latter. Some people, in their effort to bring the noose back into the heart, use a scientific method. They draw it in as they breathe. St. Gregory Palamas after having established the theological basis of this method, the return of the noose to the heart, then referring to this psychotechnical method, says that it is recommended chiefly as an introduction for beginners, and naturally this is not out of place. It is done mainly to restrain the noose, which even for those advanced in the spiritual life is, quote, more difficult to concentrate and more mobile and shifting than anything else, end quote. For this purpose... Some recommend controlling the movements of the breath in and out. This happens chiefly in the beginners in this holy activity because those who have gone ahead reach this aim automatically. He takes a characteristic example. When, when there's love, patience follows. But for some people, the opposite is the case. They exercise patience, they reach love. But the same is true of the psychotechnical methods. All who are experienced know that for the noose, this is the way back to the heart. Since the transgression, the inner man is conformed to external forms. Thus, the man who seeks to make his mind return to itself needs to propel it, not only in a straight line, but also in the circular motion that is infallible. This is reestablished by not letting the eye roam hither and thither but by fixing it on his breast or on his navel as a point of concentration. This is not original with the monks, but is also supported hagiographically. On this point, St. Gregory cites hagiographic passages which show that the noose really must return to the heart and that the attention of the noose must turn toward this point. I would like especially to refer here to Moses' exhortation, quote, pay heed to yourself. And the case of the prophet Elijah, who, as the Holy Bible says, ended the many years' drought by praying in this way, quote, resting your head on your knees and thus your noose on yourself and God, concentrating more assiduously. Also the prayer of the publican in Christ's parable and the way in which he prayed and attracted divine grace shows the power of prayer which comes with concentration of the noose when the body also takes part. Those who blame the Hesychists for this effort and call them navel gazers, apart from the fact that they are slanderers, show themselves to be abusers of those praiseworthy expressions and at the same time turn people away from watchfulness. They show themselves to be ignorant of the scriptures 
since there are many passages in the Bible which refer to this fact. The passage is well known in which the prophet King David says, quote, The law of God is deep in my belly. And that of Isaiah, quote, My belly throbs like a lyre, and my inner parts like a wall made new. After the theological, patristic, and hagiographic support which he gives to noetic prayer, or the return of the noose to the heart, and to the way in which it is chiefly recommended for beginners in the spiritual life, St. Gregory also mentions holy fathers who have used this method and experienced noetic prayer, and who show that noetic prayer is in the Orthodox tradition. Among them are St. Simeon the New Theologian and St. Nikiforos, who experienced this prayer personally and then collected patristic passages and handed down to us their niptic practice. He also refers to his contemporary fathers who lived by this ecclesiastical tradition, such as Theoleptos of Philadelphia, Patriarch Athanasius, Nilos from Italy, Sileotis and Ilia, Gabriel and Athanasios, who were blessed with a prophetic gift of grace. Therefore, St. Gregory asserts that the hesychistic method constitutes the tradition of the church. The saint says that he himself was personally acquainted with many of those saints, and they were his instructors in this holy Hezekiah. Thus, St. Gregory is organically and essentially a part of the Orthodox tradition and expresses it, while Barlaam and his adherents had no trace of Hezekiah, and their admonitions were not based on their own personal experience, but on liking to argue, that is to say, on chatter. In the second section of the first triad, St. Gregory laid down the theological pre presuppositions for noetic prayer and demonstrated that noetic prayer is in the tradition of the church. The basic points in them, which we have mentioned before, are that the body is not evil, but that what is bad is carnal thought, that the soul has essence and energy, that the soul is in essence united with the body, while its energy is dispersed outward in a fallen state, that the noose should return to the heart, which is its natural abode, that the method of return, which is recommended to beginners, is scriptural, and that both noetic prayer and the way in which it is done are in the holy tradition of the church, as many saints, ancient and modern, have lived it. In all these things, St. Gregory set out the theological basis of noetic prayer, and in essence was demonstrating that he himself was a traditional and living theologian, since he accepted the tradition and was expressing it vitally and dynamically. C. Common Energies of Soul and Body After he wrote the above, and while Barlam was in the West as a representative of the Emperor in the dialogue between the churches, St. Gregory succeeded in finding Barlam's writing on prayer, which attacked the method of St. Nikiforos the Solitary. As he had previously set out the theological basis and ecclesiastical premises of the practice of noetic prayer, now he went on to further analyses. At this point, we shall look briefly at his major positions, which interest us in this section because he speaks in them about the great value and importance of bodily participation in noetic prayer, while he is explaining theologically the great value of fasting, of vigil, of tears, and compunction for noetic prayer and for man's progress towards deification. Barlaam is presented by St. Gregory Palamas as a philosopher and an initiator of new things into the tradition of the church. He speaks of him as, quote, this new professor of inaction. He calls him a professor of inaction because by speaking scornfully of fasting, asceticism, and vigil, he is in fact leading the Christian to inaction or the opposite of praxis and action. Similarly, he finds fault with him for saying many things about prayer without having personal experience. Quote, St. Gregory writes, that although you know nothing at all about prayer, you, li you linger long in idle talk, end quote. In another place, he characterizes him as, quote, indulging in empty arguments, end quote. See triad two. But apart from the fact that he wants to abolish the ascetic method of the church, at the same time, Barlaam also disparages holy things in an unholy way. 
In order to support his own views, Barlaam even goes so far as to distort the patristic texts. He begins with the fathers, but arrives at different conclusions, because he lacks, among other things, the possibility of understanding them, since he does not adhere to the patristic tradition. Quote, for he begins with things professed by the fathers and ends on a path completely opposed to them. End quote. Of course, in those writings which St. Gregory is judging here, Barlaam found an opportunity to criticize and condemn all that Nikiforos the Solitary said, especially the method that he recommended to those who wanted to unite their noose with their heart. But I believe, as it appears from his writings, that apart from the method, Barlaam was in disagreement about the union of the noose with the heart since he had platonic conceptions concerning the human body and concerning the salvation of the soul. His anthropological and soteriological presuppositions were philosophical and not orthodox. This was perceived by our great father, Gregory Palamas. Thus, as he began to refute Barlaam's views, St. Gregory praises St. Nikiforos. He calls him a saint and confessor because being Latin, he condemned the erroneous beliefs of the Latins, became Orthodox, and then was condemned to exile by Michael Pelilogos. His life on the Holy Mountain was ascetic when he took up and lived the ascetic tradition received from the fathers to whom he was in obedience. He acquired personal experience of Hezekiah and became a guide to those who were struggling against the spirits of evil in the world of the mind. In order to help the contenders, he selected various patristic passages to use in this struggle. But seeing that the beginners had difficulty in restraining their noose, he proposed a method for this purpose. Quote, then, when he saw that many of the beginners could not even partially overcome the instability of their noose, he also proposed a means of partially restraining its wanderings and imaginings. End quote. According to St. Gregory, Barlaam did not respect either the blessed confession an exile of Nikiforos, or the pupils to whom he passed on this personal experience of his. And they proved to be luminaries, such as Theoleptos of Philadelphia, Seliotis, teacher of the solitaries, and the hermit Elias, as well as others who adorned the church with the grace of God. In his writing, St. Gregory analyzes the theological presuppositions of noetic prayer and the way in which it is done, as St. Nikiforos records it. But at the same time, he emphasizes that on the one hand, this method is for beginners who are being introduced to this holy work, who are unable to concentrate their noose in any other way, and that on the other hand, the writings were composed simply and guilelessly by him. Barlaam's basic argument is that during prayer, we should completely deaden the passable aspect of the soul so as not to activate any of its powers, not even any kind of common energy of the soul and body. St. Gregory, opposing this method of prayer, which is alien to the Orthodox tradition, said by, that by the things that he affirmed, Barlaam was in reality rejecting the fast, vigil, repentance, sleeping on the ground, and standing for the purpose for the person who's pr praying noetically. St. Gregory maintained that some of the senses, such as sight and hearing, are more immaterial, more dispassionate, and more easily conformed to reason, while touch is the most dense and least conformed to reason. He said that it's illogical to scorn the former and accept touch. St. Gregory analyzes this whole subject of the senses, and especially of touch, in the practice of noetic prayer, because it is the presupposition for Orthodox prayer, as well as its principle and its basis. Among other things, he says that any feelings that are moved by external energies must necessarily be put at rest when we turn to inner work. But this is not necessary for the good dispositions which work within the soul in the struggle for purification. Both hearing and sight are more pure and more easily conformed to reason than touch, but nonetheless we will pay no attention to them, nor be disturbed by them in any way except when what we see or hear affects us disagreeably. On the contrary, touch suffers pain and endures a great deal when we fast and do not offer food to the body. Therefore, those practicing this holy work of the soul keep sight and hearing inactive when they remain within 
and external stimuli are not working. But touch, which is connected with fasting and sleep, cannot be idle and rest, for it is an active even when there are no external stimuli. Therefore, this pain works for the good. Actually, as St. Gregory confesses, the saint knows from experience that sensation painful to the touch is very helpful to those who are praying noetically. This subject is closely connected with the theological truth that the body and the soul are bound together and coexist. The body cannot be overlooked in man's effort to be purified inasmuch as it was created with the soul, and it too will be deified. Those who pray noetically must be unmoved by outward things, and thus they, have, they can have pure and undisturbed prayer, while those who wish to attain pure prayer must rid themselves of sensual pleasure and passion. Therefore, those who care for prayer have need of, a, of the tactile pain which comes from fasting, vigil, and other ascetic actions. In this way, what is sinful in the body is deadened, and the thoughts which move the bestial passions become weaker. Thus, the ascetic also acquires compunction through which he purifies the defilements and attracts God's mercy. The ascetic effort, the pain from touch which comes with fasting, vigil, and all such actions, leads the person to the attainment of pure prayer, and that is why it is the beginning and foundation of pure prayer. Thus it is the lack of pain, called hardening by the fathers, which does away with prayer, and not the pain of touch. In order to confirm this thesis, St. Gregory cites many patristic passages in which one can see the value of hunger, thirst, vigil, tears, which do not abolish prayer, but on the contrary, engender it. The grace of God acts in the soul, and from there is carried over into the body as well, by reason of the very close bond between soul and body. Just as bodily pleasure, when it proceeds from the body to the noose, conveys to it a corporal aspect, passing on to it what is lower, without anything better, so also spiritual pleasure, which comes from the noose to the body, without being corrupted and damaged at all, transforms the body and makes it spiritual because it then rejects all the evil appetites of the body. It no longer drags the soul downward, but is lifted up along with it. Thus it is that the whole man becomes spirit, and quote from Triad 2. And he cites passages from Holy Scripture and the Fathers in order to show that the grace of God through the soul also sheds luster on man's body. For example, he quotes from the Psalms, my heart and my body cry out for joy to the living God. And in him my heart trusts. I have been helped. My body has recovered its vigor. And how pleasant your promise to my palate, sweeter than honey in my mouth. During his struggles, St. Gregory set up a basic principle. He said that, quote, contradiction on behalf of right conduct and, quote, confession on behalf of faith are two different things. Various arguments are needed for the first. For the second, only one brief confession is needed. St. Gregory used both. He drew up brief confessions of faith and also thoughts which contradicted the opposing heretical arguments. His work, quote, in defense of the holy hesychists, a portion of which we are studying here, undoubtedly belongs to the first category because it overcomes all of Barlaam's arguments, which in reality were doing away with the orthodox content of prayer. After having previously assessed the great significance which pain through touch has for prayer in connection with fasting, vigil, compunction, and so forth, he then rep replied to four of Barlaam's arguments relating to this theme. Barlaam's first argument was that since God's gifts are perfect and it is better for the soul to be above sensation during prayer, therefore prayer accompanied by suffering and sensation and pain is not a gift of God. The saint replies that the fact that prophecy is greater than tongues, as the apostle says, does not mean that to speak in tongues is not a gift of God. And the fact that love is the greatest gift does not mean that all the others, such as prophecy, miracles, helps, administrations, the gifts of healings, the word of wisdom and knowledge and discernment, are not gifts of God. 
Barlaam's second argument was that when one loves the common energies of the passable aspect of the soul and body, he fastens his soul to his body and fills it with darkness. In reply to this argument, St. Gregory said that all the pains, pleasures, and movements of the body are common actions of the soul and body. We know that there are common actions of the soul and body, which not only do not fasten the soul to the flesh, but lift the flesh close to the spirit. He had mentioned previously that the spiritual pleasures which proceed from the noose to the body transform and deify the body. This is demonstrated by the incarnation of the the Logos, the Son and Word of God. The divinity of the Word deified the human flesh by way of the soul. This takes place in the saints as well. The grace of the Spirit is also transmitted through the soul to the body of the saint. And then the body experiences divine things and suffers with the soul. The body is then deified, and this is demonstrated in the holy relics. St. Gregory refers to the case of the proto-martyr Stephen, whose face appeared in the council as the face of an angel. Therefore, this blessed suffering of the soul and body does not fasten the soul to earthly and bodily thoughts, nor does it fill it with darkness, but is an ineffable link and union with God, having miraculously raised up this body of above the evil and earthly passions. Furthermore, while the gift of teaching and the interpretation of tongues are activated through prayer, but they also go on when prayer is absent from the soul, the other gifts, that is to say healings and miracles, cannot act unless there is noetic prayer, and sometimes also participation of the body. The receiving of the Spirit, as we shall see in the case of the Holy Apostles, does not happen simply through noetic prayer, but also at moments when the body is working through the hands by touch, transmitting the Spirit to the person on whom they are laid. When God comes to people who are praying, sometimes he takes them out of themselves and they experience ecstasy and divine rapture. Sometimes, while with them, he makes all these ineffable mysteries take place through their soul and body. This was seen at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit visited the disciples. He gave them not ecstasy nor rapture to heaven, but tongues of fire, and he, the Logos, spoke through them. The same thing also happened with Moses. God did not cause him to lose his senses when he was praying in secret, but gave power to both his soul and his body, and to his arm and his staff. Therefore, whoever overlooks the beginning of prayer, which is to stand noetically before God with a contrite heart in fear and pain and much lamentation, and which is attained through that godly dejection of fasting and vigil and broken-hearted prayer, which gathers the scattered news, will think that even the end of prayer is bad, that he is not going to attain perfect prayer and acquire its fruits. Barlaam's third argument was that the highest state of prayer comes when the noose leaves the flesh and the world and when it is immaterial and formless during prayer, so that it is removed from the misfortunes of the body. That is to say, Barlaam comes back to his view, also formulated above, that for prayer it is necessary for the noose to go out of the body. So we see that in Barlaam's theology, man's body is constantly undervalued since he theologically theologizes philosophically and platonically. In answer, St. Gregory first says that if unceasing prayer is like that, then there is no one who prays unless it is this new teacher of prayer beyond measure, and those who achieve this rare state are the rarest. Then St. Gregory, who really knows prayer, analyzes exhaustively the theological meaning and significance of dispassion saying that dispassion is not mortification of the passable part of the soul, as the Stoics and other philosophers taught, but transformation of it. The fear of God is the beginning of man's perfection. This godly fear does not mortify the passable aspect of the soul, but takes it forward to a work which God loves and begets saving compunction and blessed mourning, the bath of forgiveness, that is to say tears of repentance, which brings back divine generation. This purifying weeping, which God loves, regenerates the person and deifies him. 
Thus, what is the greatest baptism after baptism is a common action of the passable part of the soul and the body. Therefore, what Barlam says is a paradox, that for the soul to love the common activity of its passable part and the body results in the person being filled with darkness and being led downward. Actually, the Holy Fathers, each in his way, teach that there are common energies of soul and body which are very profitable for the soul, since they free it from the evil passions, introduce the choir of the virtues, and bring about divine illumination. Since Barlam maintained that impassable mourning is not blessed, because it is activated by the passable aspect of the soul, and <clears throat> it is impossible to live an impassibility that is activated by the passable, St. Gregory proceeds to a theological analysis of impassibility from the orthodox point of view. In the orthodox tradition, impassibility does not consist in mortifying the passable part, but moves it from the worst to the best and directs its habitual energy to things divine. A person is impassable who has made the insensitive and desiring parts of the soul, which constitute the soul's passable aspect, subject to the faculties of knowledge, judgment, and reason in the soul. Misuse of the powers of the soul engenders the terrible passions, just as misuse of the knowledge of created things engenders the wisdom that has become folly. On the Christian's journey toward perfection, he embraces love with the desiring part of his soul, and he wins patience with the insensitive part. Thus, a man is not impassable if he mortifies these energies, for then he is not moving toward divine habits and relations and dispositions, but a man is impassable if he makes these energies subject to his noose, so that thus, through uninterrupted remembrance of God, he rises to God. The way toward God through impassibility has two variations. It works in one way in the hesychists and in another in those who live in the world. The hesychists dedicate themselves to God and devote themselves with an unclouded noose to communion with him. By this habitual association, they discard the refuse of the evil passions and gain love. While those who live in the world use things of the world, they force themselves to keep God's commandments. Thus the passable aspect of their souls makes common cause with this force, and they too enjoy love, because with time, force will make sweet the relationship with Christ's commandments. This custom will create permanently a dislike of evil habits and relationships. This dislike bears impassibility as its fruit, and this engenders love. Therefore, both the hesychists and those remaining in the world can reach impassibility through the use of force and the keeping of the commandments of God. Towards confirming these things, St. Gregory Palamas makes use of many Bible passages which seem to indicate that we must transform the energies common to the soul and the body in order to attain communion with God. Furthermore, the Holy Apostle Paul also always had within him his soul's unceasing prayer and suffering, as can be seen in his epistles. In conclusion, on this point, St. Gregory teaches in a divinely inspired and traditional way that there is a good pain which is opposed to insensibility to pain, as Barlam meant it, and there are energies common to the soul and body which aid and perfect the soul of man. The real life and true activity of the noose is for the intelligence to be occupied with divine objects of contemplation. The lovers of the beautiful, the philokalia, mortify the passable part with respect to evils and transfer it to divine love. In this way, all the powers of the soul rise to God and man acquires perfection. After making this superb theological analysis in reply to Barlam's three theses, St. Gregory Palamas came to his fourth point. Barlam, fighting against the introductory method proposed by Nikiforos for concentrating the noose in the heart, slandered him, twisted his words, and defamed him. However, in reality, he defamed not him, but himself and his own words. St. Gregory answered him, saying that what St. Nikiforos said was for beginners in the spiritual life, and Barlam was, quote, letting loose his own mental distraction upon the introductory instructions on prayer by the venerable Nikiforos, end quote. 
triad two. Furthermore, all these things were not said for the first time by the venerable Nikiforos. It is not he who first gave these teachings, which Barlam insultingly called inhalations. But many spiritual men had spoken almost the same words and thoughts. St. Gregory refers to St. John of the Ladder, who said, quote, Let the remembrance of Jesus be attached to your breathing. Then indeed you will appreciate the value of stillness. Moreover, Barlam twisted the words of St. Nikiforos. The saint recommended, quote, compel your noose to descend with your inhaled breath into your heart, which harmonized with the teaching of St. Macarios the Great, that the heart governs the whole organism, and when grace pastures the heart, it rules over all the members and all the thoughts. St. Nikiforos was connecting compel with noose and said that we must compel our noose to come out of its dispersion and into the heart. Barlam twisted the words. He separated compel from noose and combined compel with the inhaled spirit. After this, he made a violent attack on inhalations. We know that St. Gregory Palamas did not attach great weight and significance to psychotechnical methods, but he did not exclude them for beginners. The saint saw the whole substructure of this method, that is, that the noose must return to the heart from its dispersion. But this method is accepted by the ecclesiastical tradition for beginners in this holy knowledge. It is characterized as a scientific method, which helps the noose to become concentrated from its diffusion in the surrounding world. St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite, speaking about this way, about the psychotechnical methods and the holding of an inhaled breath during the practice of prayer, says that without trying, we all do it when we want to concentrate our noose. The artist, when he wants to put in a detail, holds his breath so that he can concentrate his noose better. We see the same thing in many other actions. Today, the same method is also used in athletics. Therefore, the method is not completely unacceptable, as Barlam said, but neither should it be made an absolute. It is a way for beginners. When the noose is concentrated, then it is superfluous. Barlam also slandered St. Nikiforos. While the saint was speaking about the return of the energy of the noose to the heart, having in mind the concentration of the energy of the noose away from its diffusion in the surrounding world through the senses, Barlam misrepresented him as speaking of the essence of the noose. In this way, quote, he believed that he had found numerous arguments against these holy utterances. At any rate, the saints do write about the diffusion of the noose in the surrounding world and about its return. In what follows, the saint also explains the teaching of the fathers about the heart, which he had analyzed in the second part of the first triad, and I shall not come back to it. The general conclusion is that the deification of man is deification of the soul and body, since man is not composed only of a soul or only of a body, but of both together. There are actions common to the soul and body which should lead a person to deification by grace. The noose should return to the heart and rise from there to God. The passable part of the soul must be transformed, and that is why fasting, asceticism, self-control, and vigil are essential for salvation and deification. Thus, hesychism, as St. Gregory Palamas and all the saints expressed it, honors the body, does not reject it, and therefore manifests its authenticity. On the contrary, Barlam was against the body and was basically an idealist philosopher. D. Prayer by the Christians in the world. In what St. Gregory has explained so far, it is clear that prayer which unites man with God should be done by all the people. The noose which is scattered in the world through the senses should return to the heart and then be united with God. In the teaching of Christ and the holy apostles, this truth is apparent for the Christian in the first church lived this reality intensely. Yet as we've seen before, St. Gregory emphasized that prayer, and in general man's journey toward impassibility or dispassion, has two manifestations. The hesychists experience it differently from the Christians who live in the world, but all must keep the same commandments of Christ. In his writing on the holy hesychists, it appears that he is speaking chiefly about those who have chosen the hesychistic way of life. Yet with one proportional adjustment, it refers to all, 
for the Christians have a common life. This is why in the homilies which he gave to his flock in Thessaloniki, he often stressed the value of prayer, and especially of prayer which takes place in the atmosphere and climate of orthodox asceticism. In what follows, I shall mention some of his characteristic teachings. Referring to Christ saying, you cannot serve both God and mammon, he says that here the word mammon means, quote, whatever is unnecessary for us, gold or silver or anything else. On the same occasion, Christ made clear that it is impossible to pray while guarding money. For where your treasure is, there your noose is also, but not in the prayer. In teaching his flock at the time of fasting and prayer, that is to say in the period of Great Lent, he advises them to stay away from the fluid and changeable life, and at the same time to practice fasting and psalmody and prayers if God himself is present and watching. Then he says that they must know well that neither fasting nor psalmody nor prayer can in themselves save us. But doing these things in the eyes of God, they must take place before the eyes of God, and thus the eyes of the Lord bless us, just as the sun warms everything on which it shines. They do not take place before the eyes of God when during prayer and fasting our mind is constantly looking at him inwardly. They do take place. But if during prayer our noose is sometimes directed toward God and sometimes wandering, this is a sign that we have not committed ourselves wholly to God. If we are wounded, let us call upon the Lord who is able to apply healing bandages to our wounds. It can be seen from this passage that St. Gregory wishes prayer and fasting to be personal, our own personal path. This means that we should be aware that these things are being done for God and not for another alien anthropocentric purposes. Any asceticism which is practiced without reference to God has no personal character. Referring to the transfiguration of Christ and to the gospel words that Christ's face shone as he prayed, he says that Christ did this in order to show that prayer is a cause of that blessed vision. Likewise, it happened in order for us to learn that it is through approaching God through virtue and noetic union with him that this shining is called forth, which is given to all and seen by those who are unceasingly lifted up by costly good works and sincere prayer to God. Palamas Homily 34. And since, as the Holy Fathers teach and our church sings, the vision of the uncreated light is not the privilege of only a few people, but is man's way from the image to the likeness. We must all practice on the path which leads to those things. This path consists in being close to God through virtue and noetic union with him. Unceasing prayer to God and good works offer this blessed vision to all people, given to all and meant for all. Going on to analyze the prayer of the publican in Christ's parable, he presents him as a prototype of prayer for every Christian. This prayer attracts God's mercy. In another chapter, we saw the teaching of St. Gregory Palamas where he presented the publican as a genuine type of the hesychist, but also of the praying Christian. The fact that all Christians, including those in the world, ought to pray unceasingly as far as possible is shown by an incident which St. Philotheus Kokinos recounts in his biography of St. Gregory. While the saint was living ascetically in Varai, he remained enclosed on all the weekdays only going out on Saturdays and Sundays to celebrate the Divine Liturgy and to instruct the brethren. One such occasion, he was speaking to the Christians and advising them to pray without ceasing. Citing the Apostle Paul's exhortation to the whole church to pray without ceasing, the words of the prophet David, who was also a king, I have set the Lord always before me. And the words of St. Gregory the theologian, God should be mentioned more than breathing, and he himself advised practicing unceasing prayer. Quote, Every Christian, whatever his rank, should practice unceasing prayer. At the same time, he said that we must teach this prayer and in every way guide to, to its use, not only those outside the world and living in solitude, but also men and women and children, both the wise and the ordinary, and all together. Among those present at this teaching was an old monk named Job, he was zealous in his way of life, simple in habit and shining in virtue, uprightness and all that is good. He loved St. Gregory very much and came many times to talk with him. 
But when he heard the teaching about unceasing prayer and that everyone should practice it, he began to object, saying that this instruction can only be kept by monks and those withdrawn from the world and not by the many people who live in the world. St. Gregory tried to add other teachings about these things as well. But since the old ascetic was not convinced, he brought the talk to an end, wanting by all means to avoid talkativeness and wrangling. But when that monk went to his cell and was at prayer, God sent a bright angel who said to him, Do not by any means differ with Holy Gregory about what was just being discussed between you. After this revelation, the old man went straight back to St. Gregory to tell him what had been revealed and to ask his forgiveness for that insubordination and contradiction. Indeed, when after a short time the hour came for the monk Job to leave this world and breathe his last, he thanked God for having deemed him worthy of being a friend and sharer in conversation with Gregory and of having gained great profit from his teaching and his friendship. So, Prayer as a means of purifying the heart of man and illuminating his noose can be practiced by all Christians. It is not only the monk's prerogative, but a gift granted to anyone who longs for his deification and union with God by grace. Chapter 6 Conclusion For from what has been said, it appears that man's journey toward deification passes through three stages of spiritual perfection purification of the heart, illumination of the noose, and deification. This is the common experience of all the saints of the church who follow this method and have achieved what they longed for. This journey is achieved by the energy of God and the synergy of man, since God operates and man cooperates. When the grace of God purifies a person, it is called purifying. When it illuminates, it is called illuminating. And when it deifies, it is called deifying. The grace of God is not non-hypostatic, but en-hypostatic, and it is offered in the person of Jesus Christ. But man is also needed to cooperate to respond to the energy of God. Ways and means which manifest both God's energy and man's synergy are fasting, vigil, and prayer. These three, along with others, are gifts of God which are given to the person who wants salvation and works for it. Through fasting, vigil, and prayer, the heart is purified. The noose returns to it. The passable part of the soul is transformed, and thus the whole man is deified. Therefore, all the saints, they love fasting, they love vigil, and they love prayer. St. Gregory Palamas, as we've seen, is a traditional theologian. Since he belongs to the Orthodox tradition, accepts it, and expresses it. He lived it from childhood in his family surroundings. He met it on the Panagia's garden on the holy mountain, and he guided his flock in this way. When a man has this method, he cannot end in heresy, but remains in the Orthodox Church. It is very characteristic that a heresy manifests itself clearly in the ascetic way of life. On the one hand, an erroneous ascetic method leads to an erroneous theological path, to heresy. And on the other hand, an erroneous theology is expressed in one's way of life. St. Gregory Palamas attaches great significance and importance to this point. Through the ascetic life, as seen in fasting, vigil, and prayer, when done in the whole Orthodox atmosphere and with the theological presuppositions which the great father and theologian St. Gregory Palamas describes, we too can do pure, un unerring, quote, clinical psychotherapy, the therapy of our soul. Otherwise, we shall be abstract and will spread great disappointment. End of chapter 6. Chapter 7. The Essence of Orthodox Monasticism A monk's prayer, in particular noetic prayer of the heart, is an indication that his heart has been purified of all thoughts, that his noose has been liberated from fantasy, logic, and the passions, and has returned to the heart and been united with it in the Holy Spirit. This is how prayer takes place how noetic energy develops in the heart. It is the illumination of the noose about which a great deal is said in the patristic texts. Noetic prayer must, however, take place within the climate of Orthodox tradition and in the framework of asceticism of the Orthodox Church. I say this because some people are cutting noetic prayer away from the whole asceticism of the Church, with the result that it is being presented as a Christian yoga. 
Actually, when prayer is cut off from repentance and godly mourning, from the keeping of Christ's commandment, by which the tripartite soul is purified, and from the sacramental life of the church, then it loses its value from the orthodox point of view, since it is done mechanistically, exoterically, in the manner of the Buddhistic exercises. The fact that prayer is linked with the whole ascetic life of the church is shown to us in the works of St. Gregory Palamas. The concise presentation of this teaching is to be found in a letter of his, quote, to the most reverend nun Zinya, in which he speaks about passions and virtues and what is born of noetic attention. In this letter, we see the essence of orthodox monasticism and, of course, how it differs from any other form of monasticism. It is seen clearly that orthodox monasticism aims at the cure of man and not at the salvation of the church or at finding the suitable person for a mission. Of course, we do not deny that at times when the person is cured, he does missionary work. But the primary thing is that orthodox monasticism aims at the cure of man. The monks in the Orthodox Church are struggling to save their souls, and this means, first of all, bringing the noose back into the heart and from there to God, whereupon they enjoy the whole of creation purely and clearly. From this point of view, we say that the monasteries are spiritual hospitals of the soul. This is mainly what is experienced on the holy mountain. They live in a simple manner. They renounce everything. Then they are obedient to the abbot so that their heart may be purified from passions. They pass through blessed mourning and so experience the purifying, illuminating, and deifying energy of God. This life and the path which leads to real life is not a hypothesis derived from studies and scientific occupations, but a fruit of repentance, obedience, and humility. This life is described in St. Gregory Palamas's letter to the Nunzina, and we shall undertake a small analysis here. I recognize that it is difficult to make a full interpretation, and therefore I shall set out the most central points in it which will show the essence of Orthodox monasticism. 1. Concern and Writing In the beginning of his letter, St. Gregory admits that he was reluctant to write because the heretics had twisted his words. The saint was already in the midst of the hesychistic disputes after his victory in the Synod of 1341, in particular after his four-year imprisonment. So he wrote, quote, after the year 1345, From this we observe that although he was in great difficulty, still he was occupied with such a serious monastic subject. His letter turns out to be a small treatise, which presents the essence and substance of orthodox monasticism. It also appears from this that the saint was carrying on his struggles for the truth in deep stillness as a Hagiorite monk in the true sense of the word. He did not lose his monastic quality, and therefore he wrote about mourning and godly progress. It is the offering of the holy mountain to the church and the world. It shows us how we can practice our pastoral service, our anti-heretical struggles, and all the work of the church in general. In order for all these things to be orthodox, our noose must be as pure as possible and oriented toward God. We must also point out that the nun Zinia was a remarkable nun who was acquainted with St. Gregory and who was most warmly requested him to write to her about monasticism. St. Gregory called her Most Reverend Mother. The saint confessed that it was not necessary to give advice about the monastic life, since by the grace of Christ, along with old age, she had gained an understanding of the law of the commandments through many years' practice, exercising obedience and stillness. In this way, she had reached a measure of spiritual perfection, since her soul had become capable of receiving what God had written on it. However, She had a longing for spiritual teaching, as the soul of man is never sated with this spiritual nourishment. Thus, the Nanzinia was asking him to give her advice about the life of the monks. And he replied, quote, Through your constant requests and letters and messages, you have persuaded me once again to write words of counsel 
though indeed you have no need of counsel, end quote. For the full letter to the Most Reverend Nanzinia see Philokalia, Volume 4. To continue, so the insistent requests of this holy nun were the reason for his writing this inspired text, which presents the essence of monasticism and expresses the life of St. Gregory as well as the life of the Hagiorite Fathers, who are a pattern of life for every monk and with suitable adaptations for every lay Christian. Two, passions and cure of the tripartite soul. In the beginning, his work, St. Gregory Palamas emphasizes that a true monk is one who keeps his noose single, not scattered and dispersed in many things. Quote, that one-pointed concentration of the noose, which constitutes the inner and true monk. End quote. A true monk is one whose noose is unified in his heart. In order to bring this about, the ascetic decides to live the hesychistic life and feels a distaste for everything which disunites his noose. This scattering can happen through being with many people, even monks as well, or even through writing. If you write, you burden your noose with even more demanding worries, he said. Those who have a healthy soul are an exception to this. However, even their love for God is not pure. This is much more so if the person is full of passions, in which case he should not write. The hesychist should be free from worries, and therefore many of the fathers who reached a high degree of hezekiah did not write, even though they could have written great and profitable things. When he defines what is a true monk and says that in order to keep the noose unified one must avoid cares, he goes on to analyze just what is the death of the soul. Citing many Bible passages, He says that sin is the real death of the soul, in the sense that when the soul loses the grace of God, it is deadened. The separation of the soul from the body is the death of the body, and the separation of the soul from God is the death of the soul. This is true death. In paradise, the death of the soul came first, and the death of the body followed. By violating the will of God, the soul lost its communion with God and rendered quote, the body subject to fatigue, suffering, and corruptibility, and naturally handed it over to death. There is a first death and a second death. The second death is a person's last and definitive withdrawal from God, which will happen in those who have not repented after the resurrection of the dead. Quote, death, properly speaking, is this, for the soul to be unharnessed from divine grace and to be yoked to sin. So whoever fears this second death and has the true life in him is not afraid of bodily death. Just as the life of the body is its union with the soul, so also the life of the soul is its union with God. The life of the soul does not refer exclusively to the soul, but also to the body, since man is both together. Death resulted from the transgression of the commandment, and life is experienced through God's commandment. The body tastes the life of the soul and is freed from death and eternal hell in those who live by Christ's commandments. Thus upon the body too is bestowed everlasting life in Christ, free of pain, sickness, and sorrow, and truly immortal. Just as in Adam the death of his soul preceded the death of his body, so also now the life of the soul precedes the life of the body. In Christ, through his death on the cross, his soul was separated from his body, while neither was separated from the Godhead. And later, the resurrection of his body took place. The same happens also with man. Even if the souls of the righteous are separated from the body prematurely, still, since they themselves are not separated from God, there will be resurrection and ascension of their bodies. All will be resurrected, righteous, and sinners, but only the righteous will be taken up. The attainment of life, which is the cause, a cause of immortality and true life, should begin now. Towards this aim, God has accorded us this present life as a a place for repentance. Repentance is required. 
There is no need for despair, which the devil suggests not only to those who live carelessly, but also to those who practice the ascetic life. Repentance is closely linked with man's free will, that is to say, with his freedom of choice. God, in his love for mankind, gives man time to repent, but if he does not want to repent and return, he does not take away the power that he gave us. Nevertheless, he continues to invite man to engage in the works of life. This is made clear in the parable of the vineyard. Our Heavenly Father calls us through his Son and reconciles us to himself, not taking into account our offenses. Yet he not only calls us, but he even promises a reward, and indeed an inexpressible reward. Christ himself says, I came that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. The fullness to which Christ refers not only signifies being together and living together, but also the fact that he made us brethren and co heirs. In order to acquire this fullness, man must give up all that stands in his way, that is to say, wealth, soft living, vain honors, all things that are transitory, and every sly and abominable passion of soul and body, all the litter gathered while daydreaming, everything heard, seen, and spoken that can bring injury to the soul. Therefore, repentance, a change of direction, is the return of the noose to God, the attainment of life through repentance. Repentance and the giving up of all those things which cause harm can be experienced by all people, but especially by monastics. This is possible also for married people to look after the purity of their soul, but this is done with very great difficulty. Therefore, those who love salvation, who are looking to the next life, choose the virgin life. Since also this body of ours is hard to harness and hard to lead toward virtue, this means that it is worse when we are bound up with many bodies. It is difficult to avoid cares when one has the care of many people. For married people, care is not blameworthy, but it is forbidden completely to those who are living the celibate life. Clearly, St. Gregory Palamas is expounding this teaching in this letter because it refers to nuns who have chosen the life of virginity, and for them he wants to emphasize freedom from care and purity of soul. It does not at all mean a disparagement of marriage in Christ. Moreover, in his homilies given in Thessaloniki, he refers to marriage in Christ and underlines its asceticism. But also in this letter, which he is sending to the nuns, saying the things to which we have referred, he recalls the passage in St. Paul, quote, The time is short, so let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those involved in worldly affairs as though they were not involved, end quote. Interpreting this passage, he says that the struggle of a married Christian, as St. Paul advises it, is more difficult to accomplish than that of a virgin, I think. The asceticism of the married Christian is more difficult than that of a monk. This is demonstrated by the fact that fasting is easier than self-control in eating and drinking. After choosing a life of virginity, she must live It diligently and fruitfully, he reminds her of Christ's words, I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. He prunes every branch in me that bears fruit so that it may bring forth more fruit. The virgin is a bride of Christ. Theonymphi, a branch of the vine of life, and therefore on the one hand she must rejoice in the love of the bridegroom, and on the other hand she must respond to it with obedience. The virgin should not desire the worldly life, because that is a disgrace. The people of the world are dead to God, and so what kinship can the bride of life have with the dead? According to Christ's words, there is a narrow gate and a straight way, and there's also a wide and broad one. The former belongs to monks who cannot pass through it with a load of self-glory, an outpouring of self-indulgence, or the burden of money and possessions. This way of life appears dull, but it also brings solace, confers the kingdom and reign of heaven, and fosters salvation. The second way, the wide and broad one, belongs to the worldly, but it is not free from sorrow. 
On the contrary, it is filled with many oppressive misfortunes. The narrow and straight way is not independent of poverty of spirit. The Lord blessed poverty, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. It is not a question of poverty of body, body alone, but of poverty of body, which is accomplished in accordance with the soul's humility. This humility is essential because it is possible for someone to choose to shed possessions and to be frugal and abstinent simply in order to be praised by other people. This is not being poor in spirit because self-conceit is contrary to being poor in spirit. He who has a contrite spirit regards himself as completely unworthy of praise, prosperity, and comfort. While thus far St. Gregory has been laying the foundation of the monastic life, now he goes on to develop the subject of curing man's of his passions. From this point onward, he makes a wonderful analysis of the passions and their cure, because orthodox monasticism aims at the cure of man. Man's soul is tripartite. In other words, it has three powers, the intelligent, the insensive, and the appetitive. When the soul is ill, its three powers are also ill. Christ began his cure of the soul with the appetitive power. For desire unsatisfied fuels the insensive power, and then the intelligence too is ill. Therefore, the insensive power of the soul cannot be cured before the appetitive power is cured. Nor can the intelligence be cured until the other two powers have been cured. Therefore, the appetitive power must be cured. The first offspring of the appetitive power from babyhood is love of material possessions, and avarice comes a little later, although still in childhood. At first, children want to possess various objects, and avarice and greed appears later because avarice does not have its ground in nature but in choice. The passions of avarice spring from disbelief in God's providence. Love of material possessions and avarice produce many evils such as greeds, covetousness, thievery, and so forth. Not only are many passions derived from avarice and love of possessions, but so is the lack of any inclination to do good. The noose of a living pinchpenny is dead, and in reality it is buried in the dust, and gold buried in the earth, just as the dead are buried in the earth. The grave of the a vicious person smells worse than the tombs of the dead. For more on that, see Letter to Nunzinia and Gregory Palamas, Philokalia, Volume 4, pages 304 and following. To continue, voluntary poverty delivers men from this foul smelling and deadly passion of avarice. A monk who has the passion of love of possessions and avarice is unable to be obedient. Therefore, renunciation precedes obedience. A monk who does not wish to be freed from this deadly passion is likely to fall into bodily illnesses. After having analyzed the fact that the first passion of the appetitive power of the soul, which must be cured, is love of possessions, love for material things, St. Gregory then goes on to the second passion, which is self-flattery. This passion develops in the person before the passion of love of the flesh, while the person is still quite young. There are two kinds of self-flattery. One is worldly vanity, which is connected with beautifying the body and having expensive clothing, your image of yourself. And the other is a kind of self-flattery which afflicts those noted for their virtue and is accompanied by hypocrisy and self-conceit. This passion can be cured by a longing for divine glory, by a sense of one's own unworthiness and by patiently enduring people's scorn, esteeming God's glory above one's own. If there is any virtue, one should attribute it to God and have one's attention on him. A great help in curing this passion is withdrawal from the world and living a life of solitude, keeping yourself to yourself. Likewise, one can avoid self-conceit when one sees the disgrace which the passion brings. A passion related to self-flattery is the desire to win men's esteem. This passion is the subtlest of all the passions. And since it is the subtlest passion, one must not merely be on guard against coupling with it or 
avoid assenting to it, but also regard the very provocation of the thought as assent to it and must shield oneself from it. The desire to win men's esteem is a disastrous passion. It leads the person further to lack of faith. The enjoyment of praise from people generates envy, which is potentially murder, quote, the cause of the first murder and then of the slaying of God. Finally, the passion of self-flattery leads a person to great improprieties. The third passion, which is the offspring of desire, is gluttony, from which arises every kind of impurity. Gluttony is closely closely connected with fleshliness, and it comes third in the sense in the series in man as he grows older. However, it is inborn in us. How is this to be explained? St. Gregory Palamas makes excellent observations on this crucial point, which is a concern of contemporary psychology. He says that not only this passion, quote, but also the natural motions related to the beginning of children can be detected in infants that are still at the breast. In other words, both gluttony and the natural motions related to the begetting of children appear even from infancy with the infant's desire to suck from their mother's breast. But we say that they appear more slowly in man because in infancy these passions are natural and therefore not indictable, not blameworthy, that is. These passions in infancy do not indicate illness of soul, but they become evidence of such illness in those who misuse them. Quote, when we coddle the flesh in order to foster its desires, the passion becomes evil, and then self-indulgence is the beginning of carnal passions and an illness of the soul. This teaching of St. Gregory is important because it shows the attitude of the Church toward all those psychological analyses of the reactions of infants and children's souls, analyses which create more problems. St. Gregory calls to mind that the noose is the first victim of these passions. The noose is moved by passion since it collects the imagination of sensory things through the senses and uses them in a passionate way. It is shown from the example of Eve that this happens chiefly through the eyes. Therefore, much attention needs to be given to the senses and the noose, the eye of the soul. Thus, although the passions are regarded as existing in childhood, they do not conduce to sin, but to the sustaining of nature, before the mind becomes embroiled with them. In children, the natural movements towards childbearing are not sin, unless the noose is passionately involved. At all events, a person who wants to be free of passions must give great attention to the impassioned noose, to extinguish a raging fire, it is no use to fight the flame, but one has to pull away the material that is causing it. The same thing is true in spiritual matters. For the passions of prostitution, it is not enough to fast and to make the body suffer, but the most important thing is for the sources of inner thoughts to be dried up through prayer and humility. St. Gregory is a hesychist in all his homilies, but much more so on the subject of curing the soul. He emphasizes the need for curing the noose. We find in the teaching of the Holy Fathers that the soul's contemplative faculty tightly surrounds the appetitive faculty and the sexual passions. This is why the cure must be localized there. Bodily hardship and moderate abstention from food are needed as well, but what cures the passions of the flesh is bodily hardship and prayer, issuing from a humble heart. Thus, the monastic should cultivate the contemplative faculty, stillness. He should remain in his cell, enduring hardship and praying with humility. The cell of one who is rightly pursuing the monastic life is a haven of self-restraint. It is possible within one's cell to live in solitude and acquire spiritual poverty. Three, spiritual poverty. The noose and the passions are cured by means of spiritual poverty. Therefore, the holy hesychist advises, quote, Let us then also become poor in spirit by being humble, by submitting our unregenerate self to hardship and by the shedding of all possessions. 
Man's whole spiritual life is an experience of spiritual poverty. The saint previously emphasizes the blessedness of poverty, and now he undertakes a broad analysis of it. First, he emphasizes the link between spiritual poverty and the temptations. Just as plants, in order to bear fruits, have to go through winter and endure the conditions of every season, the same thing has to happen with the person struggling on the path of virtue. Quote, For it is through patient endurance of afflictions deliberately entered into and those that are unsought that each person is made perfect. From his letter to Nanzinia. The soul cannot bear fruit unless the winter's hardships come first. Unless we bear with patience the afflictions that come to us unsought, we cannot receive a blessing for what we do by our own will. This means that if we cannot endure the trials of life, we cannot receive blessing from the ascetic effort and hardship which we ourselves choose and practice. A person who lives in repentance expects every affliction, accepts every temptation, and is glad of it, because it is purifying for the soul, productive of prayer, and a protector of the soul's health. The blessed grief is connected with spiritual poverty. Sorrow for worldly poverty brings death, while the sorrow of godly poverty leads to repentance, as the Holy Apostle Paul says. St. Gregory analyzes in a wonderful way the benefit of godly grief, which is an element of man's rebirth and essential for the spiritual life. There are four types of spiritual poverty. First, poverty in our way of thinking. Second, in body. Third, in worldly goods. And fourth, through trials and temptations that come to us from without. Since he has already analyzed the poverty that comes from temptations, the other three types of poverty are dealt with thoroughly in what follows. Every experience of poverty generates the corresponding grief and solace. Bodily poverty and humiliation willingly suffered include hunger, thirst, vigil, and in general the body's suffering and hardships, as well as a reasonable restraint of the senses. This bodily poverty gives birth to the grief and tears which bring contrition of heart. When the soul is freed from evils and bitterness through contrition, then it enjoys solace. Poverty and how we think is closely connected with self-reproach, which is essential for the cure of the soul. In the beginning, self-reproach, it leads to fear of punishment, especially eternal punishment, with all that is connected with it. This grief, as long as we still live it, is very useful because it attracts God's mercy and brings us consolation. But this self-reproach in itself is an intelligible weight lying on the soul's thoughts. It presses and squeezes out the saving wine that gladdens the heart of man, that is to say, our inner self. Poverty in worldly goods constitutes the virtue of holy poverty. This shedding of possessions has to be conjoined with poverty in spirit in order to be pleasing to God. From this spiritual poverty come grief and consolation from God. It happens in the following way. When the noose is withdrawn from all material things and from the turbulence they generate, and becomes aware of its inner self, then first of all it sees, quote, the ugly mask it has wrought for itself as a result of its wandering among worldly things, end quote. This means that when the noose is diffused among the sensations in the surrounding world, the person ceases to be truly a person. Seeing this ugly and formless mask, it strives to wash it away through grief. After the noose has purified and rid itself of the covering of passions, it enters into its treasure house and prays to the Father. Then God gives gifts, such as peace of thoughts and the humility which is the begetter and sustainer of every virtue. Here is the noetic paradise in which all are all the trees of virtue. In the midst stands the sacred palace of love, and in the forecourt of this palace there blossoms ineffable and inalienable joy, which is the harbinger of the age to come. The results of spiritual poverty are very many. 
The shedding of possessions gives birth to freedom from anxiety, which then gives birth to attentiveness and prayer. From these virtues comes grief and tears, which wipe away the soul's prejudices. Then the path to virtue is easier. The conscience becomes blameless, and from there spring joy and blessed laughter of the soul. Now the tears of tribulation are transformed into tears of delight, and the person enjoys the gifts of the betrothal. But it is also demanded to see the bridegroom, and not only to receive gifts of betrothal, both communion and union with the bridegroom are necessary. This takes place as the noose continues its journey. When the noose, along with the other powers, returns to the heart and is purified of every idea and fantasy, then it will stand before God deaf and speechless. When it has ascended to God in truth, not in imagination, it becomes an overseer of various things in the light without being separated from the body. Then truly by the ineffable power of the Spirit, quote, it hears unutterable words and sees invisible things. It becomes an angel on earth, and through itself it brings every created thing closer to him. Thus the person becomes natural since he unites all creation and proves himself to be the microcosm in the macrocosm. Then St. Gregory cites passages from the Holy Fathers which explain the state of the noose and the results of the vision of God and Theoria, such as those of St. Nilos, who says that the light of the Holy Trinity, it shines in the noose. Of St. Diodocus of Photiki, who says that in the state of illumination, divine grace paints the likeness over the image in us. And of St. Isaac the Syrian, who says that purity of the noose is that which the light of the Holy Trinity illumines within us. The noose illuminated and unified by the light of the Holy Trinity transmits to the body united with it many tokens of the divine beauty as well. So then the body also is in the stable state of virtue and becomes disinclined or has little inclination toward evil. The word, the logos, enables it to perceive clearly the inner essences, the logai of nature. One apprehends the supranatural realities, and naturally then all the gifts of grace are given, quote, various miraculous effects, such as visionary insight, the seeing of things to come, and the experience of things happening afar off as though they were occurring before one's very eyes and in general, all the gifts which God gives. St. Gregory insists on the point that the thing which has great importance is the return of the noose to itself with all the other powers. Quote, the return of the noose to itself and its concentration on itself, or rather the reconvergence of all the soul's powers in the intellect, however strange this may sound, and the attaining of the state in which both the noose in itself and God worked together. St. Gregory. This is essential, for prayer alone is not enough unless all the powers of the soul, including the appetitive and insensitive powers, are working together. 4. Blessed Grief After developing the theme of godly poverty and describing its therapeutic consequences for man's noose, inasmuch as it leads to the vision of the uncreated light, he comes back again to his favorite theme, which is spiritual grief. First, he emphasizes the fact that there is worldly grief which accompanies unsolicited worldly poverty. This grief lacks all consolation, for it does not give consolation to the soul, especially when the sufferer lacks true knowledge. He has no consolation because he increases his pains, since he lets his reason be subject to the pleasures and pains of the senses and does not subject the latter to reason. Thus, grief about worldly poverty is a worldly sorrowfulness that leads to the death, which is an evil darkening of the soul. Next, he refers to passages in the Fathers concerning the darkness that sin creates in the soul, about the effort to purify the heart from passions, and the fact that worldly sorrow is connected with all the passions in man. The passages cited are from Basil, St. Basil the Great, St. Mark the Ascetic, and St. Macarius of Egypt. The attainment of this blessed spiritual grief 
is necessary. Without grief, even if a person makes himself poor, he can too easily return to that which he has abandoned. Thus the grief which the Lord blessed not only brings solace and provides a foretaste of eternal joy, but it also protects virtue. So a person, he gains stability on his spiritual journey. When one experiences grief, one gains another good thing as well. Not only does he become disinclined to evil and does not return to those things which he did in the past, but it makes them as though they had never existed. St. Gregory's words here are astonishing because they show that grief purifies a man completely and brings him back to the state in which he was before he sinned. So he becomes completely pure. When he grieves over his sins, God regards them as unintentional and therefore without guilt. Anyone who has sinned but continues to grieve, his sins will be regarded by God as unintentional and he will enjoy eternal life with those who have not sinned. Quote, If a person who has sinned against God continues to grieve over his sins, his sins will be justly regarded as unintentional and along with people who have not sinned, he will journey without stumbling on the path leading to eternal life. Grief at first is painful because it is conjoined with the fear of God. In the course of time, it becomes united with love and brings the sweetness and sacred solace of the Comforter's blessing. Only those who know from their experience can confirm the sweetness of godly grief. The sweetness of grief is described by two examples. One is taken from betrothal and marriage. The beginning of grief is like a petition for betrothal to God, which seems almost unattainable. The grief which which comes resembles words of courtship, which are offered by the soul, which wants to be united with the most pure bridegroom. But it does not see his presence and is not hoping that he will come. So it weeps, grieves, and mourns, but the consummation of grief is a pure bridal union. Just as the partners unite in one flesh, so also the grieving soul is united with God in one spirit. The other example is from the parable of the prodigal son. The beginning of his grief is like the return to the father with the words, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the consummation of the grief resembles the moment when the father goes to meet him and embraces him. In the father's embrace of compassion, the son is embraced and embraces back. Then after going back with his father, he feasts with his father, sharing with him the joy of heaven. Let us then, in the words of St. Gregory, in blessed poverty also fall down and weep before the Lord our God, so that we may wash away our former sins make ourselves impervious to evil, and receiving the blessings and solace of the Comforter, glorify him and the unoriginate Father and the only begotten Son, now and always and throughout the ages. Amen. Five conclusions to chapter 7, The Essence of Orthodox Monasticism. This text of St. Gregory Palamas is astonishing. God inspired and authentic concerning man's journey toward deification and, and salvation. He was writing for monks, but by analogy, it is valid for all Christians. The Lord was addressing all his disciples when he spoke of the blessedness of poverty and grief. The same framework remained, but the depth and measure of the grief and purity changed. We can come to certain conclusions. A. St. Gregory Palamas's writing demonstrates that orthodox theology is a therapeutic science and a way of life. This means that it leads to communion and union with God. The church is a spiritual hospital of the soul. Thus, all the patristic texts are therapeutic, and we should interpret them in this light. B. When we speak of therapy, we mean chiefly therapy of the noose and the heart. St. Gregory made a thorough analysis of the fact that the soul that the noose falls ill when it is diffused into the surroundings through the senses, and it is cured when it returns to itself, descends into the heart, and then rises to God. This constitutes man's journey from the image to the likeness, from the hideous mask to the person and hypostasis par excellence. 
In the Orthodox Church, we cannot accept person-centered theories apart from Orthodox asceticism. We're not concerned with an abstract philosophical view, but with Orthodox view of the person. C. The struggle and effort to be rid of passions should be associated with the return of the noose to the heart. Therapeutic treatment, which is limited to the surface without also being aimed at curing the noose, is only moralization. Here we see the value of the niptic theology of our church. To eliminate hesychism from Christian living is to make orthodoxy worldly. This is why we must adapt the therapeutic treatment to curing the noose. Any spiritual fathers who do not know this method are simply unable to cure their spiritual children, leaving them without a cure or in spiritual narcissism and spiritual self-sufficiency. The teaching about inward grief will make the treatment orthodox and ecclesiastical. Otherwise, it will be humanistic Western. D. The cure which is recommended by the church, as analyzed here by St. Gregory Palamas, is very realistic and natural. He knows the tragic condition caused by the passions, and he cures the noose and the senses, the soul and body, man and society. There is no one-sidedness, no making autonomous, no over valuation of one thing at the expense of another. The whole man is healed, sanctified, becomes God by grace and being sanctified, also sanctifies creation. E. Orthodox spirituality whose center is the heart solves all the social, political, and ecological problems in a realistic way. And this is because when the noose is cured and the passions of love of possessions, love of glory, and self-indulgence are cured, man becomes sociable and kind to his fellow man and his environment. Therefore, the cure of the noose is a solution to all the great problems of our time. F. This paradise, as described by St. Gregory Palamas, is still preserved on the holy mountain Athos today. The Hagiorite monks and those abroad are struggling to be cured, and many of them have been cured. Thus they manifest the dynamic quality of Orthodox tradition and its timeliness. They show in practice that Orthodoxy is not an ethical and philosophical system. It is not a human and social organization. But the divine human body of Christ, the Theanthropos, the participation of the uncreated grace of God at different depths cures man and unites him to God. Thus the Orthodox Church is a sanator sanatorium, a spiritual hospital. The message of St. Gregory Palamas and the Holy Mountain, whose spiritual child he was, is a message of life, hope, and optimism for contemporary wearied, beleaguered, and oppressed man.